Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 22nd, 2007, Thanksgiving here in the United States. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Chris Colby from Brew Your Own Magazine tells us how to go big in a new way. He's calling it reiterated mashing. That's making a wort from a mash, then using that wort as mash water in a second and even a third mash to get high-gravity brews with lighter colors and little caramelization. Well, if you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through both basic and more advanced brewing techniques. Well, it's official. Our new low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVDs are on the site and in the house. In this, uh, our newest DVD, Steve Wilkes takes you through a single-step decoction mash and makes it look easy, by the way. Also, I take you through the uh, lager fermentation process and introduce what I'm calling the low-tech lagering system, or LTLS. Now, the, the LTLS is a contraption that I developed with input from Andy Sparks of thehomebrewery.com to lager, even in the summertime here in the south, without the use of a dedicated chest freezer. Now, this is something that's a bit cheaper than a chest freezer, and it's portable. So if you live in an apartment or if you're renting a house and you don't want to tote a big freezer from place to place, this can work for you. Now, as far as I know, I've got the only LTLS in the world right now, so I'm very interested to see what kind of modifications and improvements brewers make to the system. It should be fun to watch that develop. Also, the LTLS can help you brewers in uh, hot climates ferment ales at the proper temperature. I get emails all the time from uh, uh, brewers down in Florida or Hawaii or, you know, Southern California where it's just hot and they're trying to, you know, ferment ales at the proper temperatures. Well, this this is something that could help you out. Now, how does it work? You have to check out the DVD and see. <laughs> Sorry to do that to you, but, you know, think of all the free stuff that you get through this podcast. So far, 121 episodes, not a single penny do you have to pay, except for bandwidth and all that. <laughs> so I refuse to feel guilty. Now, uh, to go along with our new DVD, we've got uh, new DVD combos. We have our original basic combo, which has our extract and all-grain DVDs. Then we have our advanced combo, which has our all-grain and lagering DVD. And then we have our triple combo, which has all three. So you save some, save a couple bucks by getting a combo. Also, uh, don't forget our 2008 Brewer's Logbook, which is also available on the site. And uh, thanks to everybody who's already jumped on the site and picked up some of our stuff. Hate to be so commercial this early in the show, but I, I want to make sure that you guys know about the new DVD and logbook. I'm very excited and uh, can't wait to hear what you think. And uh, I'm starting to see, it's a funny, around Christmas time I start seeing more uh, female names coming through the uh, store. So, you know, if, you, if you're wondering what to put on your Christmas list, anyway, that's enough of me talking about that. <laughs> And uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, emailed their brewing horror stories. Uh, we've got some good ones so far, but I'm greedy. I'd like to I'd like to see some more. Send your tales of uh, brewing gone bad and how you worked your way around it to james at basicbrewing.com or just use the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Uh, maybe we can learn from each other's mistakes and uh, have some fun at the same time. So... Uh, Steve, Steve and I want to get together and drink a couple of beers and, uh, you know, read these read these stories to you. So, anyway, help us out. It's a, a short week this week, and uh, I'm trying to get ready to uh, spend some time with the family. And we've got a, a nice long chat with uh, Chris about his new mashing technique, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, not only does Chris tell us how he... Uh, gets high gravity wort from this reiterated mashing at the end he gives us tips on fermenting these high gravity brews well chris colby welcome back to basic brewing radio hey james thanks for having me and we're talking about big beers this time and what you're calling reiterated mashing 
First of all, where did you get the idea? What inspired you to go down this road? Well, I was I was actually on somebody else's podcast. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel cheated uh, on. I was, I was on a, the Brew Crazy podcast, and I was drinking uh, a beer that he had brewed that was a high-gravity beer, and I had brought along my uh, Sammy Claus clone, which is a – Sammy Claus is a – European uh, high gravity lager that they brew seasonally, and um, I got to thinking about uh, big beers and specifically producing work for big beers. And um, I had heard somewhere um, when we were doing research for a story on Sammy Claus before that their brewery, the the Hurleman Brewery, um, when they go to mash Sammy Claus, they take the the late runnings from another beer and use that as the mash water. Um, as a mash liquor and it occurred to me well if you can take the final runnings and do that well why can't you just do it with full-on wort and and how would that work and so I I thought about it for a while I uh, eventually sort of drew up some plans to do it and then I ended up doing about four test batches of uh, beers where I either used wort to to mash a second uh, grain bed, or or I did that, and then additionally used the the second mash, this you know the doubly mashed wort to mash a third grain bed, and then that became my uh, the reiterated mash story. Now uh, I think Randy Mosher mentioned something about so, a, a similar technique in radical brewing, but it's been a while since I read the book and I loaned my copy out, so I couldn't research that, but <laughs> but it may be in there uh, something similar. Um, but I don't think it's exactly what what you did. Yeah, his he mentions the technique, but I don't think there's any details on how how exactly it worked. Um, and you know, it was probably a very similar idea. You used, you know, uh, wort as your mashing liquor um, instead of uh, water, and you, you know, instead of concentrating your wort in the kettle by boiling it down, you concentrated in the mash tun by, you know, having the, the wort sugars and, and starches, you know, dissolve into your wort in, in the uh, in the mash tun rather than, you know, boiling it down in the kettle. Before we get into the step-by-step on the re- reiterated mashing, let's talk about the more traditional ways of, of getting uh, high-gravity wort. If you were to make want to make a barley wine, um, what are the, you know, kind of standard ways of of a brewing that you would do that. Right. Well, well, if you're typically a brewer who, who's, you know, all grain brewer or, you know, you do a full mash with every beer, there, there's, a, there's a few ways that you can do it. Um, the easiest, of course, is, you know, just uh, take some grain, do, do a complete mash, and then add malt extract to, to write, raise your gravity up to your target. You know, that's very simple. Um, you don't have to boil for longer than an hour. You don't have to do... You know, you don't need a large uh, mash tun. You don't need a large kettle. You know, you just add malt extract. Um, a second way would be to, if you do have a larger mash tun and a large enough kettle to, to boil some down, you know, add quite a bit of mash or, you know, quite a bit of grains to your, to your bigger mash tun. Um, you know, sparge them fully. Uh, so, you know, you'll collect wort until the final runnings reach, you know, 1.010. And you'll have, you know, a bunch of, you know, roughly 12 Play-Doh wort, you know, maybe 1.48 or, you know, it depends on your efficiency. But, you know, you'll have a whole bunch of full-strength wort, and then you just boil and boil and boil and boil, you know, until you get down to a high gravity. Um, the third way, is, and, you know, this would take a, a very large mash tun, uh, you know, just put a ton of grains in your mash tun, uh, mash it, and just run out the first runnings. Uh, you know, if you if you're going with a normal strength mash, the, the runnings are going to be around 85 or 90. You know, 1.085 to 1.090, uh, and then you don't sparge. You know, so so you don't dilute that. And then you know, from there you can boil it. Uh, you know, you can have a, a normal one hour boil or 90 minute boil, and you know, reach very high gravities. So, you know, those are those are basically. And there's you know different twists. Everyone's got their own little, you know ways of combining the two um but you know it's basically add malt extract boil forever or only drain you know the the very high gravity runnings 
Now, what are the uh, disadvantages of those uh, procedures? Yeah, well, every um, you know, every, every way you're, you're going to generate very high gravity work, you know, including my method, has advantages and disadvantages. Um, with the malt extract one, the, the only real disadvantage is the cost. You know, it's just a little bit more expensive. And then uh, also, you know, if you're if you're some kind of all grain purist, then you know you're you're going to think of that as cheating. Um, but the plus side of the malt extract thing is it's just quick. You know, you skip having to deal with, you know, bigger equipment, longer boilings, blah, blah, blah. Um, for the second one, the, uh, you know, gather a ton of wort and boil forever method, um, drawback there is time. You know, you uh, you do get good efficiency because you'll, you know, you'll take your, your grain bed and you'll, you'll sparge it completely until you have, you know, you've collected all the wort you can from it. But the downside is is that wort will be fairly low gravity, and you'll just have to boil and boil, and you know you're paying for the propane, and you know your your wort is darkening as it goes. Um, it'll be you know darker than than if you had added malt extract. Um, and the third method, uh, you you don't get a very dark beer because you don't boil it for long, but your your efficiency is just terrible because you you know uh, you just ground up all the grain and, and just ran off the first wort. Um, you know, which again, as a, as a home brewer, you're not, uh, you know, e- even a relatively big batch for us is not, you know, it's not going to financially kill you or anything. But you know, a lot of people think that, oh, I've left all that sugar behind in the grain bed, and you know, also as an option, um, and and that would be entirely entirely another show. But you could, you know, if you had that that big of a grain bed and you drained all that for a barley wine, you could easily, you know. Resuspend it with water, drain off, it, and make a you know pale ale. Yeah, make a make a second beer, make a a small beer, as Anchor calls it. Right, and the uh, you know so the drawback of the third method is just efficiency, but it does have the advantages of you will get a relatively light colored wort. You don't have to boil forever, uh, you know, so you don't need a bigger kettle, and um, yeah, and then when you get to my method, um, I'll just give the advantages up front. It's that you don't need bigger sized equipment. Uh, you can brew very light colored beers, and the disadvantage is just time. You end up, uh, as we'll see, you end up <laughs> investing some time in your brew day. Well, it's not not necessarily a bad thing if it's a pretty day and you got some cold home brews, and I guess you have ACDC on the uh, boom box. And, uh... Yeah, you got to have ACDC on the boom box. <laughs> that goes without saying. <laughs> if you like brewing and, you know, uh, you know, I, I brew it on my porch, if, you know, like if, if the sun is shining and you know, I've got some music playing or whatever. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, you know, I'm a brewer. That's my hobby for a reason. I like it. So to me, a long, a long brew day isn't, isn't a bad thing, you know, especially if I get, uh, you know, if the beer turns out right in the end, you know, or at the end of the brew day, so the wort turns out okay, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm happy. So how do you start? How do you start uh, formulating your recipe for, for something like a re- reiterated uh, beer? Okay, yeah. When you um, formulate the recipe, the idea is you're, you're going to have either two or three different mashes, and you're you know you're going to each subsequent mash is going to be mashed with the wort from the previous one. And I found out by trial and error that the the best way to do it is to have the the size of each mash be the same, the same amount of grains in each mash. So what what you want to do then is you want to um, take a look at your kettle size and figure out, well, how much am I going to boil? What's my pre-boil wort volume going to be? And then from there, you, you do it sort of backwards <laughs> with the way no, people normally do it. From there, you figure out how much grains do I need to get a full volume of wort there from a, from a grain bed that's fully sparged. And um, this, again, depends on you know how, how finely your grains are crushed, what your louder ton efficiency is, you know, water chemistry, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, using about 10 pounds of grain to get about six pounds of, or six gallons of wort, that, that's about right for most home brewers. You know, that's, that's maybe a little conservative. You can maybe eke a little bit more volume out if you wanted. But, um, you know, uh, you want to you wanna calculate an amount of grain that you, you know, you mash and you sparge fully and rinse it completely so that the first the first grain bed is completely rinsed, you know, there's there's no more sugars left in it that are usable and that yields your full 
wort volume. So that's so so far it's just a, a standard all grain brew. Yep. Yeah. And so yeah. So when you plan, you figure out that amount of that amount of grain, and then you just either double or triple it. And that you know the then the grains you use, you know, it depends on if you're making a big stout, you'd have to you know make it, each one a stout grain bill, or if you're brewing a pilsner, you you know each one it might be just all pale malt. Or you know whatever the style of beer, but but the amount is you figure first based on your pre-boil volume. If you're using, say for instance, uh, my typical uh, base uh, grain bill for just a, a pale ale is like ten pounds of two row and one pound of sixty level bond crystal. Sure. Would I just do that three times, or is the the color of the crystal going to compound over those two or three mashes to make it darker than I want? Yeah, you would have, you know, if you did that, you know, three meshes in a row with, with a pound of Crystal 60 in it, you would end up with five gallons of beer with the equivalent of three pounds of Crystal 60 in it. Uh-huh. So that would be, I mean, what I would do is if, if you were trying to make a, you know, if that was your pale ale recipe and you wanted to make like a, a barley wine or a, or a super barley wine from that, what I would do is, um, you know, you can do it however you want, but I mean, I would recommend doing just a, a mash of pale malt first, then go, you know, have your second one be 10 pounds of pale malt and one pound of Crystal 60. Or, you know, the first two be pale malt and then the last one be the ones with the color it's in it. Um, I mean, you, you could spread them out, uh, but, you know, it's. Uh, and also, in a, in a very high gravity brew, I, I would even think about decreasing the amount of. Of like crystal and specialty malts, because you're gonna, you know, those tend to yield uh, some unfermentable sugars and raise, you know, the final gravity of the beer. But when you're already dealing with a huge, huge beer, you know, um, you you don't want things that are going to be pushing the uh, final gravity higher because you've already got enough things working against you in that respect. You want a fairly fermentable wort. Yeah, I would work on, you know, if I was going to do that, I would cut down the amount of. Uh, Cut down the amount of uh, crystal sixty. I would probably even add a little bit of flaked maize to the uh, to the recipe to you know um, keep the you know you keep the alcohol level up, but you would get a lower, more fermentable wort. But you know, again, that's that would be the, the decision the brewer would want to make for themselves. So we've got our first beer. We've got our first wort that would be a perfectly good beer in the in the brew kettle, but uh, we want to we want to kick it up several notches. So what do we do next? Right. So instead of, you know, taking your, your perfectly good, you know, full pre boil volume of wort and, you know, boiling it and adding hops, what you do is you would add that total volume to a second grain bed. Um, you know, this this grain bed would be the, the same uh, amount as your first. So what you'd have there is you'd be mashing uh, your, your wort in the entire volume of of, or, you'd be, or you'd be mashing your grains in the entire volume of uh, wort. So you, your liquor to grist ratio would be fairly high. You know, you'd have sort of a lot of liquid to the amount of grains. But since it's wort instead of uh, instead of water, and since in the method you don't mash out, you know, you don't heat the grain bed up, you've got, you know, the wort's going to contain not only the, the starches and then the sugars, uh, from the first mash, it's going to also contain the enzymes, and those are going to continue to work. So your second mash sits there, and <clears throat> what you need to do is um, you need to let it uh, let it sit and stir it occasionally, and give it time for the carbohydrates, you know, the starches and sugars, to dissolve out from the, the grains in the second <clears throat> in the second mash. One thing one thing I noticed. Uh, one thing I learned the hard way, actually, in one of my triple, triple mashed brews, was that it takes time for, or it takes more time to dissolve all the stuff out of the grains when you're mashing with wort than it does with water. You know, with water, in you know, ten minutes or so, uh, everything is dissolved completely. And uh, but when you're mashing with wort, it takes about maybe about an hour, and that's with stirring every every ten minutes or so, fifteen minutes. Something like that. Stirring the mash will um, will help the uh, the goodies dissolve out of the grain in, in your second mash a lot quicker. And um, 
One thing, if you have a refractometer, uh, this it really, really helps to use it with this method because you can, you can stir your grain bed and you're going to know what the gravity of your first wort was because, you, you know, once you have your full, uh, the full volume of wort from the first mash, you know, take, take the specific gravity. And then you expect your second mash to be almost twice that. You know, you know you're probably not going to get exactly twice that, although sometimes you can, you know, homebrewers' efficiency is low enough, and there there can be some flukes that maybe you'll, you will get twice that much or even more. Um, but, uh, you know, conversely, if you are a commercial brewer or a homebrewer who really, you know, works to eke, you know, every last bit of uh, sugar out of their grains, you know, you're not going to get the full double. Um, but anyway, if you take a refractometer and just take readings every 10 minutes or so, you know, you'll see that they're going up. And then when you get, um, when you get to a point where, you know, the amount, the amount that it, uh, it goes up is is starting to, to tail off, you know, then you can proceed either to, you know, run off your second bet, uh, your second word and boil it, or you can run off the second word and, you know, proceed to the, the third mash. So you put uh, you put the grains uh, for the second mash in the brew kettle. Now, what, right. For what, the second and third mashes, I mash in the kettle, and then when the mash is done, I scoop it over back to the the louder tun. So what what is the temperature? You don't do a mash out on your initial mash, and and uh, you run off into the brew kettle, right? Right. No. Any before the the only time you mash out is with the final mash. What temperature is the wort? When you add your first uh, or your second mash to the kettle, um, for the first mash, I do uh, I do it around 150. You know, that's a, a range where you're going to get a relatively fermentable wort. And then uh, for the second mash, um, I run that into the the kettle, stir in the grains, and that's going to settle into you know it, it depends on your equipment and and what temperature your grains are or whatever, but that's going to settle into around 140. Um, and given that it's in your kettle, you can heat it to whatever you want. Um, if my second mash is going to be my final mash, I leave it at 140 for a little while. Uh, you know, a low temperature mash like that uh, leads to a very, very fermentable wort. Um, if it's my second of three mashes, then I'll heat that up to 150 and let that sit for the, uh, the hour or so that the second mash goes. But yeah, that when you... When you add the hot wort to the the cold grain, you do get a, a drop in temperature. But since you're doing it in your kettle, uh, you know a little heat, a little stirring will get you to wherever you want. And you got to think that um, the initial sugars uh, from the initial wort, the enzymes are still working on that. So that so that's becoming more fermentable as time goes on, right? Right. Um, one thing. One thing I mentioned in the mess method is that when you do your first mash, there's um, unlike normally, there, there's no reason that you need to wait for full conversion. You know, all you're waiting for is to, um, you know, I would recommend going about 20 minutes, stir a couple times just to get everything dissolved, but then just start running it off. You're gonna, you know, there'll be plenty of starches at that point, but given that you're not doing a mash out, there's also the enzymes, and they're free to start working on that, and then. When they're combined in the second mash, you know, the enzymes from the first and second mash are present. The starches from the first and second mash are present. And, you know, um, even after 20 minutes, at, you know, depending on what malt you use, you, you may have close to complete conversion on the first mash. Um, but it, it really doesn't matter because the second and third mashes are going to go for a while. And, you know, so any, any starches you carry over in, in any of the mashes prior to the final one, just don't matter because they're going to be in an enzyme-rich environment. Wow. So you don't you don't need to worry about in the in the mashes leading up to the final mash. You don't need to worry about conversion. Just um, just uh, dissolving essentially. Just that the uh, uh, the the stuff you want in the grain dissolves into the wort, and you can track that with your uh, refractometer. So if you're just doing uh, two mashes. If you're only doing two mashes, uh, <laughs> once you finish the the conversion on the in the kettle, you scoop it over into the the louder tun, and then uh, start loudering back into the kettle, and uh, proceeding kind of as normal that way. 
Right. Well, the second mash is mashing in your kettle. Just uh, dump your grains. Uh, take a hose and just rinse out your uh, louder ton. Um, then you know you scoop. When when the mash is done, you scoop it back to your louder ton, and let that sit for a couple minutes. And while you're doing that, rinse out the rinse out the kettle. And you know once once the grains have sort of settled, um, you know you can do a, a brief recirculation step. Um, you know, on your final mash, you're going to want to do a full recirculation and, and clear up the, uh, the wort just like you normally would. But on the, on the, the mash or mashes leading to that, uh, I only did just a very quick recirculation just to strain out like the biggest chunks floating in there. <laughs> and I carried, you know, I carried over cloudy wort, um, both times just because there's, there's, it didn't make sense to me to add, you know, 20 or 40 minutes to my brew day doing a full recirculation when it was just going into another mash. Right. You know, and you could, uh, you know, clean that up. I, you know, I haven't experimented with a method to know enough that if you can, if you can run out, you know, completely unrecirculated mash with, you know, all the, you know, uh, with, with everything dissolved in it, you know, you might, you could envision, envision a, a point where you just have such cloudy wort in the first two mashes that your third one sort of sticks when you recirculate it. No. Uh. Um, but I don't know. On the other hand, maybe you wouldn't. You know, maybe it would just, uh, you know, work fine. Um, so I, I took sort of a, uh, the middle road and just I, re- I recirculated about five minutes, and, and you know that's enough generally um, to get the worst of the cloudiness out of your wort. You know, you get the you you filter out the actual like chunks you see floating through, right? And uh, it starts to you know it's not clear by any stretch of the imagination, but it's that that's enough to do a decent job. So if you if you're doing a third mash, you go back into the kettle with the the double thick wort and add more grain at that point and do it again. Right. So there again you have a thin uh you know, thin mash in, in regards to the liquor to grist ratio. But now you actually have your liquor is double strength wort. So it's it's a very thick mash in that respect. Um and so you know, it's enzyme rich uh, you, you know, it'll be, uh, you know, your wort will have been at 150. When you add it, it'll drop to, you know, in the 140 region. So uh, I would heat that up to, you know, 140, anything in the 140, 145 region. Uh, you know, let that sit for a while. And, and for a while, it could be in anything from 20 minutes to two hours um, or, or even longer. Um, but, you know, it's, it's already a long brew day. You're probably not going to be looking for ways to, extend it beyond that but uh you know give it certainly enough time at the low at the low end to to get a degree of fermentability you want um stir it to get the uh you know the sugars dissolved and and track that with your refractometer and then you know when when your when your low temperature rest at 140 is done ramp it up to uh somewhere in the in the conversion range in the in my article i used 154 just a sort of a compromise between it's at that temperature it's going to work pretty you know the the final any bits of conversion are going to go pretty quickly and you know you've already done the low temperature rest so like go ramping up to 148 to 150 is you know why bother um and then you know so do do your normal uh final rest in the in the normal you know brewer's window then ramp it up to uh uh the mash out uh, which will help you with loudering. You know, you've got very thick wort at this point, so any you know any help you uh, can get in the loudering is going to help you. Um, transfer it over your louder ton. Do a full recirculation that time. Clean up the wort, and then um, you're going to run off triple strength wort into your kettle. And you know, in the second and third mashes, there's also one thing in the article I described is there's a little bit of sparge water added just simply to make up your volume each time because every time you add the 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 mash liquor to the grains it's going to absorb some so you just you know uh you just take a little little bit of hot liquor each time and and sparge right at the end just to just to keep the same amount of like if you're doing a five gallon batch you want to collect six gallons of wort for your first mash six gallons from the second six gallons from the third and so in the third you end up with six gallons of you know not quite triple strength wort uh and you know then you can boil that and uh if you've got a, if you've used like a lightly colored 
uh, grain, the, the triple strength wort is going to be just insanely light colored. Like, you know, most, most dark beers have a, you know, well, a lot of them are, are, are made to be dark by the grain bill, but even if you try to make a light colored beer by, you know, boiling a long time or even by boiling with malt extract, you know, the best you, you tend to get is like, you know, kind of an orangey color. Mm-hmm. Uh, with this method, you can get like just, you know, flat out like a golden or even almost a straw colored. Wow. Yeah. If you, uh, yeah, so it's, it's nice because you can really pick the color you want your beer to be with your grain bill, not, and not have to worry about the, the flavors and the colors from, uh, wort, you know, quote unquote caramelization, uh, in the kettle. So how long is a brew day on a, on a double iterate, double iteration? And how long is it when you add the third? Um, yeah, when you do uh, two mashes, you've got you figure your first mash is about 20 minutes. The second mash is about uh, an hour, and you know then you've, there's also the recirculation steps in both. And there's also just the time. You know, um, a, a one hour mash is never just one hour because there's there's time. And so uh, you know, it's hard to say. Maybe maybe you're mashing on a one hour. Or, or on a on a double mash one, the the mashing part alone might take three hours. And on a, a triple one where you do three mashes, you've got both your second and your third mash are going to need to go about an hour. The first one probably only needs 20 minutes. You know, you've got the recirculation step. Um, one nice thing on these is that given that given that you're uh, um, in, in the second mashes, you know, especially, in, and in the first mash, the way I have it rigged is you basically do a no sparge mashing. You know, you mash, uh, in the second one, you know, you've got six gallons of wort and you've got your, uh, grains. And when that's done, you just, you louder quickly, you know, you just run it all off. Mm-hmm. And in the first, there, there's a sort of a kind of a, a half ass no sparge. The way I do it is I, I mash at a normal liquor to grain ratio. Then I just add water to the mash ton to to basically the uh, full pre-boil volume, you know, and then just run all that off really quickly. So the uh, the loudering time isn't, you know, you're not spending an hour or 90 minutes collecting your wort at each step until the final one. Or well, actually, no, not even the final one. You just run it off quick. Um, so yeah, the the three mash one, you know, you're probably looking at five or six hours of just the mash part. But then you know. Uh, your boil is only an hour, whereas it might have been six, seven, eight hours uh, for for a beer of that strength. Right. So I, I mean, I, I think very roughly the, in time considerations, you know, in the time that you need to devote to it, I think it's very roughly the same as the collect a lot of wort and boil forever method. <laughs> you know, it's. Um, you know, side to side, I think they're going to be just about the same time because you, you know, you don't get something for nothing. You're the time that you, you know, add or, or take away from the the long boil is is added in the time that you know you have to to, to be mashing. So right. I think they're roughly equivalent. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say that you know it's down to the near to 15 minutes, but I'd say it's probably within an hour of being the same. So now that you've got this huge, thick wort and you go through the boil, what are the special uh, precautions that you need to take as you're going into the fermentation step? Yeah, fermentation of, like, you know, extremely big beers uh, is is something that you really need to pay attention to. Like, you can, on a normal strength beer or even a, a normal sort of big beer, as long as you're basically pitching the right amount of yeast and you've, you know, got pretty close to the right amount of aeration, you know, things are going to work out for you. On these very big fermentations, you've got to, you know, you've really got to pay attention to, to everything. And then on the biggest, sometimes things can still screw up. Um, so, I mean, when you when you ferment a, like a very big or, or a very very big beer, um, the first thing you need to do is is get enough yeast to pitch. I mean, you might have to for a five gallon batch of some of these beers, like one that you've made from three mashes. You know, you might need to make a, a full five-gallon batch of beer just to raise yeast for it. Or, you know, if you're lucky enough to have access to, a, like, a brew pub and you know the brewer and can get, you know, 
a, just a you know a bunch of fresh yeast from him that would be good too so pitching pitching a lot is is definitely uh a good thing you can also it, dried yeast is fairly inexpensive you can just buy you know several packages of that you can go to the the mr multi calculator online figure out how much you need and you know probably relatively affordably i mean these beers are already you're spending a ton on the grain so you know why would you cheap out on the yeast yeah and that's uh, just to give uh just to to make sure that we give the link properly for for those uh, looking for a calculator, uh, Jamil Zanishev's uh, calculator at mrmalty.com is that's that's where that is. That's very very handy. I've used it I've used it on more than one occasion. Yeah, nice little calculator. Just uh, gives you a good idea of you know what the what the optimal pitching rate is. But the, but this is this may be a good opportunity to make uh, like a a regular 1050 beer. And then, you know, time your brewing so that you're racking off the primary on the day that you're brewing. And, you know, put that big old beer on top of that yeast cake from that previous uh, batch. Yeah. I mean, I, I would even argue that you'd want to do uh, like a 1030 to 1040 beer. I mm. mean, because you're, you're raising yeast and, you know, you want it. It's, it's got a big job ahead of it. You want the, you know, when you raise it, you want it to have an easy, easiest job as possible. So, I mean, if I was doing uh, like a barley wine, like an ale, I'd probably brew like a British bitter or, you know, a Scottish, uh, you know, low-gravity Scottish ale and then use that yeast. Um, if I'm doing a, a lager, which I, I used, I did lagers for all these beers, um, uh, you know, brew. Uh, I actually just made beers that I dumped uh, just as starters, uh, you know, and they were just sort of low low-gravity pilsners. Um, and, but, you know, you, you need, you need that yeast. That's, as a starting point, you're just going to need to, to pitch, uh, a decent amount of yeast. Um, the second thing is aeration. You need to aerate well. And one sort of unusual technique for, uh, for big beers that, that, that differs from brewing, uh, regular strength beers is that a lot of times you want to aerate multiple times. Like I'll, on, on my very big loggers, I'll aerate, you know, with oxygen, uh, you know, right at the end of brew day, pitch the yeast. And um, that's generally, you know, it's in the evening by, by the time I get it done, uh, you know, late at night if it's this method. Um, and then I'll wake up in the morning and go out and give the give the word a second shot of oxygen. You know, at that point, it's probably not at high croissant yet, or even if it was uh, sort of approaching that, you know, give it more oxygen at that point because, you know, with all the active yeast, uh, they're going to soak that right up and, and use that and be more healthy. Mm. So second, you know, having, uh, you know, at least a second shot, if not maybe a couple different shots of oxygen leading up to high croissant is a good idea when brewing, you know, extremely big beers. Uh, yeast nutrition is another thing you really have to worry about. You want, you know, you you don't want any point in the, when they're growing or fermenting them to run out of some sort of nutrient that they need to go because, you know, they've got, you know, they've got enough to worry about. So, um, you know, get a, get a good yeast nutrient, you know, um, take a look at, at the manufacturer's recommendation and, you know, I would add at least the maximum amount that they, you know, they give the maximum amount and it's probably for a normal strength beer. You know, for me, that would be the starting point. And you know that, that's sort of something you've got to you have to brew a couple big beers and, and seeing what the performance is because you don't want to you add too much of that and it gets like to be yeast crack and they just go nuts and you, <laughs> and you don't want, you don't want that because you've got you know you're going to have enough problems controlling this fermentation uh, without you know overstimulating the yeast at, at the beginning uh, but you know you want enough yeast nutrients that they uh, are doing good you know and the, the combination of uh, aerating more than once and adding nutrients should, you know, should mean you get a really good start to the beer. Um, finishing off high gravity beers is, is another thing. Um, you know, typically if you if you get enough aeration up front, enough yeast, enough yeast nutrition, you know, you'll get a good start. But on on extremely big beers, getting a good start to the fermentation doesn't always guarantee a good finish. You sometimes need to push things along and the absolute best way to do this and it's one thing I do with every high gravity logger I do is save some of the wort initially 
like before it's aerated, uh, save, you know, um, usually about 10% of your volume for a five-gallon batch. I'll save, you know, about two quarts, roughly two liters of wort. And then um, you'll aerate that, the, the, the reserved wort, you know, really well, maybe add a pinch of yeast nutrients, add, you know, fresh yeast to that and get that fermenting. You know, at that point, that's Kreuzen beer. And then you add that, that fermenting beer to your, you know, mostly fermented beer, and that'll uh, kickstart the fermentation, and that does really well. And then as the second fermentation starts to slow down, um, you know, if it's, if it's a lager, pull it out of your lager fridge and move it to somewhere where it's going to, the, the temperature is going to raise up to ale temperatures. And then when it starts slowing down again, give the whole carboy a swirl just to sort of get the yeast back into uh, uh, suspension. You know, if, you, if you've got an ale, um, you know, you're already at ale temperatures, um, add the, you know, get some fermenting beer and add it uh, again. If it's an ale, it wouldn't technically be called Croissant beer, but it's the same exact idea. Um, and then you might even want to, you know, if it's an ale, uh, you know, swirl swirl the carboy, but you might even want to move it to, you know, find out what's the upper range of the yeast temperature. Uh, and try to move it somewhere where it's like right there or maybe a couple degrees above that. And, you know, that last little bit of, uh, you know, heating up the word at the end, stirring the yeast into it, uh, we usually make sure that you get a good, you know, a decent enough final gravity that your beer isn't just sort of, you know, sickly sweet. So after all this, uh, this care and, and, uh, close attention, what, what were your final, uh, alcohol levels, your ABV levels? Calculated levels, they're going to, on a, on a double, you know, two mash versus a three mash, you know, it's going to depend, obviously, on, on what your extract efficiency is and stuff. But for, um, you know, using the, the BYO's, uh, uh, you know, 65% extract efficiency, and then assuming that you get 75% attenuation, which is kind of a big assumption. Uh, I mean, it's, it's doable if you pay attention. Uh, you're going to end up with roughly a 9%, 9 or 10% alcohol beer for the, uh, the one where you do two mashes. And you're going to end up with, you know, something in the 13 to 14 percent alcohol range with something you do with three mashes. Mm. And then, you know, that also assumes that you just did a one-hour boil. If you if you additionally go with a long boil, you know, you can you can keep shooting higher. Um, so, yeah, I actually, I my my beers right now that I've brewed this way, I, I need to make a second batch of Croissant beer and knock them down. I uh, I brought them to my my homebrew club, and uh, we tasted them, and they were really sweet. And mm. I measured the uh, I measured the specific gravity, uh, you know, the the final gravity, and, and one of them was was 1.070. The one the, the one I brought was, you know, still like <laughs> basically a big beer waiting to be fermented, uh, even though it had started at much much higher. So the the alcohol level really wasn't tremendously high, um, you know, but the yeast just, you know, they had so much sugars to chew through that they. Uh, um, you know, had a tough time. So, uh, you know, I've still got that whole batch basically, and I'm just going to, uh, it was in the keg. So I'm just going to pitch some more Croissant, Croissant beer to that. Uh, let it sit at lager temperatures for a while. And when it slows down, uh, heat it up, swirl it around and see if I can't get that down to, you know, 35 or 40 in, in that range, you know, would be about as much attenuation as you could humanly expect from yeast. <laughs> Now, would you think about adding something like a champagne yeast or a distiller's yeast at that point? No. Um, I mean, you, you you could, or like a Y yeast, Oy de V yeast or something like that. Um, I, I would stick with beer yeasts. I just I think when you start adding uh, champagne yeast at the end, I, I don't think I've ever seen that yield good results. I mean, for one thing, champagne yeast is used to working on simple sugars. And, you know, the simple sugars are long gone from your word at that point. There's really nothing, you know, unless unless your problem was, you know, that the yeast just haven't eaten anything, uh, champagne yeast isn't going to have much to, to feed on at that point, you know, although I guess you could add Beano or something. Mm. Uh, but I generally try to do it all with beer yeast. Um, you know, other people, 
uh, opinions obviously differ. Uh, White Labs does have a super high gravity ale yeast, though, and I mean I would consider using that even even on lagers, just because you know you'd be using it for the last little bit, not the whole primary fermentation, and you could uh, you know uh, chew down chew down your word that way. Yeah, I did I did find out that. Uh, the choice of, if you're making lagers, the choice of your yeast is very important. I made, uh, the first one I tried of this, I, I tried to start with an Oktoberfest yeast, and it got, like, nowhere. <laughs> it, I mean, and this was a big starter, you know, full aeration. Everything was, you know, everything was primed to go, and it only chewed, like, you know, 20 gravity points off the top. Wow. You know, I was like, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> and... uh so I, the, the second and, and all the subsequent beers I did, I started out with a Bach yeast, and those did a lot better, although on their, on their own they, they, they weren't going to cut it. And then I used, uh, for, for the Kreuzen beer, I used um, White Lab's Zurich Lager strain, the one that, that supposedly is a Santa Claus strain. Mm. And that, that did get the beers down to, you know, now they're merely big beers. Uh, you know, and another, I know from experience with that strain, having brewed Santa Claus clones, you know, that ended up in this range that, uh, you know, uh, you can keep coarsening with that beer and you can get to, you know, the gravities you need. Well, it, uh, it's, it's really got my, uh, my wheels rolling, you know, in my head. When I first read the article, I was like, wow, I, I got to do that. So I'm, I'm thinking about trying to do like a, a little batch you know, doing like a maybe a one gallon or two. Uh, yeah, I did. I did all mine as three gallon batches. Ah, well, there you go. Instead of the normal, it's all written up in the in the article as a five gallon batch because that's a standard homebrew size. But I did it just because I know I'm not that much of a big, huge beer drinker. That, um, and also I had some three gallon corny kegs, which is, which are super sweet. Ah. And uh, so I did I did mine all as three gallon batches. Um. But one nice thing about the, uh, and, and one thing I mentioned in the article a couple times, one nice thing about this uh, procedure is that you can brew a gigantic beer, but you you can use your normal five-gallon brewery to do it. You don't need a bigger kettle. You don't need a bigger mash tun. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, honestly, the first couple times I tried this, or at least the first time, I sort of thought, well, this will be kind of neat. It'll be like a little quirky thing, and I'll do it once, and I'll, I'll make, write like a little article for BYO because no one's going to want to go through this. But I did it, and even with all the, all the problems that I had in the first one, it, it, it worked pretty well. And I was like, wow. And on the subsequent ones, um, I kept, you know, refining the process and refining the process. And so, you know, what's in the article is like, um, and, and I don't mention all the all the, the refinements I make. I just, you know, give the final the way to do it is is a fairly refined way of doing it. And I was just shocked at how well it worked. Hmm. I was like, the the first time I tried it, I, I sort of thought that, you know, you'll get your normal efficiency from the first mash. And I thought, and, you know, on the second mash, you'll get, you know, a greatly lowered efficiency. And, you know, at that point, that was all I was willing to try. And But the results of the first one indicated that, well, no, you can get a really, you know, you can get almost, the, you know, double strength worth out of it. And so that spurred me to try, um, you know, a, a second one where I did the revision where you use the same amount of grains each time, and so my second, you know, two mash one went really well, and well enough that I thought, well, I'm going to try the three mash one. <laughs> and then my first three mash one was kind of a disaster, but I learned from it, and and the 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 second you know three mash one was like really good, and I'm actually uh, I'm not sure if it's this weekend. I think it's next weekend. I, me and a, a homebrew buddy, we're going to do a all Maris Otter one. We're just going to, you know, Maris Otter, Maris Otter, Maris Otter in three mashes. And he's a big long boil fan, so I think we might boil in additionally for a long time. And then we're going to use White Labs Super High Gravity Ale Yeast and just try to make a... I mean, our, our idea was like, we're not going to do this unless we just make like a, a monster. <laughs> like something that's just, you know, terrible. <laughs> yeah, you know, in the, in the real meaning of the word. Um, uh, so yeah, we're gonna give that a try, and uh, you know I think obviously this is something that uh, home brewers who are all grain brewers, you know they're gonna have to invest a little bit extra time in that brew day, but I think the results are gonna be such that 
it's it's not just a curiosity, and I think homebrewers are going to want to try it. And I think, you know, and I'll be really interested to hear back from other people in in, in how well they get it to work. But I think people are going to try it, and I think people are going to like it. Yeah, I hope so, at least. But well, we appreciate your uh, your spending your time in in research to uh, further the knowledge of the homebrewing community at large, and to uh, further your uh, your seller of giant beers. <laughs> Yeah, which will sit for years. <laughs> I, I mainly drink pale ales. <laughs> yeah, and I should mention that in the article, I, I give two recipes for uh, for big loggers. Um, and uh, so, if you don't want to go through all the the hullabaloo of formulating your own recipe, you know, at least the first time around. Um, but it's really, you know, it's the sort of thing where I wouldn't, you know, if I was doing it, I wouldn't worry too much about like beer styles because obviously these these aren't recognized beer styles they're just huge huge beers um and you know just try it with try it with just plain pale malt or you know pale malt and a little flaked maize or you know if you if you got to add some specialty grains throw in some you know if you want it to be a dark beer you know throw in some black patent or whatever or uh chocolate or something but uh you know keep it simple and just worry about getting you know huge huge work well excellent well i appreciate it again chris it's always always fun Well, thanks again to Chris Colby of Brew Your Own Magazine. Be sure to pick up the December issue to get all the details of the reiterated mashing process. You can get a free copy of Brew Your Own by clicking on the BYO banner on basicbrewing.com. And if you decide to subscribe after reading that issue, you'll be helping to support this podcast. And thanks to everybody who's done that already. Next week, we talk to homebrewer Bob Taylor from Alaska on making sake, something that a few of you have requested as a topic in the past. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And uh, don't forget we need your homebrew horror stories, those days when brewing goes wrong and uh, what what you've learned from it. And also, I forgot to mention at the top of the show, our uh, latest episode of Basic Brewing Video is out there where um, Steve makes a Belgian or Flemish beer stew. Very tasty. And there's a bonus blooper clip at the end of that. So be sure to stay tuned all the way to the end of uh, this episode of uh, Basic Brewing Video. Uh, The 2008 Brewer's Logbooks are here. Check them out on our site, and check out the new low-tech lagering decoction mashing DVD, where you can see Steve do a single-step decoction mash and follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of summertime here in Arkansas, where I I don't use a dedicated chest freezer. Uh, There are also our original DVDs and basic brewing introduction to extract home brewing. We walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling, and in basic brewing, stepping into all grain, We take you through the all-grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. And don't forget our new combo combo deals or combo deals. Save you a couple of bucks. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it from us online. And uh, also thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Canon PowerShot A720IS 8 megapixel digital camera with 6x optical image stabilized zoom. Wow. And Star Trek Space Seed Kirk and Khan action figures. Now was that was that was that Ricardo Montalban's real chest in that movie? I don't know. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support there. And if you can't see the Amazon logo on our site, your browser may be blocking it. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson, our buddy in Austin, who also designed our logo. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. (laughs) 